Prominently and interestingly, a number of black artists were very sensitive to the fact that they were refugees. And my own favorite painting dealing with the subject entirely is by Henry Osama Tanner, who has in the museum of the Metropolitan Museum of Art a wonderful, mysterious, uh, evocative painting of the flight into Egypt, where they're not surrounded by all sorts of uh, fiddlers and uh, angels and, and guards and guardians, but are, they do have one person leading them into the first city in Egypt they get to, but it's very, very evocative. And indeed, Tanner associated the flight into Egypt with the flight, uh, the plight of persecuted black people and with the migration of blacks to the north for jobs. It was one of his two favorite topics. He painted the Good Shepherd uh, about 15 times, and he painted this flight into Egypt about 15 times. After developing the whole program, collecting the images, writing the text, I discovered that Pius XII in 1952 had said exactly what I laborious had to laboriously had deduced from all these art images that the Holy Family was the paradigm of a refugee family. I have to tell you I was disappointed at Alice to find that the Pope got their words. <laughs> so this evening that will be a background issue, <clears throat> but the, the foreground issue is to reflect on some art of the Christmas season and in particular the art surrounding the adoration of the shepherds and the adoration of the magi and to ask what more may be there than the we traditionally see in art around these subjects and as Joan summarized uh, the issue I propose is uh, we look fairly easily at the art of the shepherds adoring the Christ child, and the Magi adoring the Christ child. Um, who else gets worshipped? And there are all too many figures who do. There is a tendency to absolute, absolutize authority. <coughs> think of this man. And think of the way he commanded the loyalty, allegiance, fealty, adoration, of large segments, not all of course, but large segments of the German population. I also wanted, I think for the first time in Western culture, to begin a lecture on Christmas with this image. I think you'll be able to say, we saw something no one else had ever seen in a Christmas lecture. Uh, Ludwig, uh, Ludwig Feuerbach in the mid 19th century argued uh, as a First, one of the first great atheists <clears throat> argued that what we call theology is really an extrapolation of anthropology. And everything we say theologically, everything we say about God, is really a projection of what we know about ourselves. And the, in, the repeated inclination of people to bow before powerful figures is uh, a lack on their part. Is it a lack on our part that we worship God and that at the Eucharist we worship Christ recalling his life and suffering for us? Or is it the fulfillment of a capacity for self-giving and self-forgetfulness that more truly fulfills us than anything else? Uh, atheists believe that and religion is a distraction from commitment to human life. And I will be asking implicitly, with every image we look at, is the worship we see here something we can identify with, uh, or is it really a kind of never-never land, a way of pacifying our other feelings, as Marx said, a, a, a soporific for the masses. <coughs> Think of the way people received every word in China, of everybody of course, but of Mao Tse Tung. Uh, scripture never was better received than the red book, the little red book of Mao Tse Tung. So here is somebody that 
uh, in, in our recent last century, Roman emperors, of course, were, were deified on the coin that Peter found to pay the tax for Jesus, on that coin that he found in the fish's mouth, it was a denarius, that would have been written, uh, Filius Divine Augusti, meaning it was the, the coin of a son of the divine Augustus. And of course, in, well into the 20th, 20th century, um, uh, the Japanese emperor was believed to be a god. And it was only after the war, with considerable uh, diplomatic necessity, that the Japanese people were led to accept the fact that their emperor was not a god. Well, the Christmas story, I th believe, has much to tell us about what real worship is and how dangerous worship is when it's misplaced. Here is a, an early, well actually a mid, um, first quarter of the 18th century painting. Could we turn down the lights a bit? I think you'll see better. Um, let's experiment with that. I need still to see my text, but Isn't that better? Yes. I think so. Thank you, Joan. And Anne? Yes. Um, and I can not see, but let me get my... A, an Italian painter from the late 17th to the mid 18th century, and this is a painting from the first quarter of the 18th century. I show it for two reasons, uh, because of its typical character, and also because I took it from the, one of the new Roman missals. Uh, uh, this, this is luckily, the art in the new Roman missals is by and large luckily uh, not for the public because it's very badly chosen. But this will be shown to the priests. And I'm thinking about an article on the education of our priests and couldn't they be given, please, better art. This is okay. This is okay. But what do you notice about it? Um, the traditional ox and ass, the baby in front of a Latin altar, under a breaking down um, classical ruin. And why is that? Because uh, frequently, as we'll see in earlier examples, the, um, the contrast is made between the new faith and the new world and the declining paganism. So that's why you have the altar here. Uh, pardon me, and it's tomb actually, this is a tomb. And this is a shepherd. Oh, is that in the way? Thank you. We'll get to look at that later. So this is a shepherd, and the picture has been cropped in the missile, I stole it from the missile. This is a young shepherd. And Joseph is peering at what? The procession of the Magi arriving to worship uh, Jesus. Now, what's typical here is that two stories are woven together. The, the Lucan story of the shepherds coming to worship Jesus and the Mathean story of the Magi coming to worship Jesus. At the end of the, of the presentation, I've excerpted some pages, just a few pages for you from Raymond Brown's great book, The Birth of the Messiah, 
which compares the way the two infancy narratives in Luke and Matthew uh, present the birth of Jesus. Ray uh, wrote this book some 25 years ago, uh, even more than that, 35, and argued in the book that uh, contrary to the uh, view of some extreme exegetes, the Matthean and Lucan infancy narratives are serious parts of the gospel, and in fact are, uh, each of them, a gospel in miniature. And we'll see some of that as time allows this evening. Where else would you see a scene of the uh, crib or of the birth of Jesus with the shepherds from Luke and the Magi from Matthew uh, together almost everywhere. Uh, for example, at the wonderful tree at the Met, which is late 18th century Neapolitan, uh, you have them, the shepherds up closer, presumably they got together first because they are at least portrayed by Luke as being, having the news brought to them in the middle of the night. It's a beautiful detail. Um, but the Magi are coming, now kings, on their wonderful uh, mounts. There's a horse and there's a, there's a, a uh, elephant, if I remember correctly, and a camel, of course. And then there's everybody else in the world there. Well, I'm not going to complain about that. I love the thing. Uh, Philippe de Montebello, by the way, thought it was kitsch. But uh, I asked Tom Campbell, the new director, one time, soon after he arrived, you're not going to get rid of the tree, are you? which Philippe would like to have done. And he said diplomatically, I really wanted to know how he felt about Philippe. Yeah, he said diplomatically, well, you know, it does take up a great deal of space. <laughs> which, which gave him leeway to move it if he wanted, but I don't think he will. Uh, let's look at uh, some images of the adoration of the shepherds. It's not damaging to uh, conflate the two Gospels, but each writer has a particular point of view <clears throat> as something he wants to bring out. Matthew, for example, distinctly in the embassy narratives, wants to present Jesus above all as the Messiah, the fulfillment of the promises of Jewish scripture as the Messiah, the anointed of the Lord. His Gospel is built around the uh, theme of promises in the Old Testament and fulfillment in the New Testament. Luke, on the other hand, is wants to portray Jesus as the Son of God, that title above all. And it's helpful to follow each theology uh, <coughs> through as much as you can uh, on its own. Here are some images of the adoration of the shepherds. This is a, I've gone a little bit far from, from the Met because there are so many great images. I wanted to show you some others. There's a wonderful image of the Adoration of the Shepherds by Duccio, but this is by Giotto di Bondone, who lived from about 1267 to 1337, and this is called the Adoration of the Shepherds who don't seem very busy in adoring the Christ child, do you? Do they? Um, so you might call it a simple nativity. Uh, Giotto was thought for centuries, was called for centuries the founder of Western art. Duccio has come to have almost equal claim to the title, but what is so wonderful about this early painter, this was done about 1305, um, is the humanity of it and the, the naturalness and the complete freedom from the conventions of Byzantine art. The, uh, there's no golden background anymore. This is a mother having just delivered her child lying in a bed under a little, what would you call it, a little hut. Uh, she's had an assistant, non-biblical, but okay. Joseph seems worn out and worry. The, uh, the sheep, well, why are they over here? Well, because he wants to get, this is a small panel in the Scrivani Chapel in Padua, 
which Giotto did for the Scrivani family. The whole chapel interiorly is designed and painted by Giotto the frescoes. He wants to combine the Annunciation, the proclamation of the birth of Jesus to the shepherds. The angel of the Lord, Luke says, proclaims the good news that in the city of Bethlehem uh, is born to you a savior, the son of God. And they're getting the uh, message from the angel around whom then a heavenly host assembles. And then they're going to make haste to Bethlehem to see the child and his mother. Uh, the ox, the, uh, the ox and the ass, are also of course not biblical, but God help you if you claim they weren't there. <laughs> this is from uh, the Metropolitan, and this is <clears throat> the Giotto is the about 1305. This is 150 years later, and it's by Andrea Mantegna. And I've shown it here in this auditorium before uh, in an Advent talk. And you can see the progress in the in technique, uh, but founded, founded on Giotto's innovation of uh, modeled human-looking forms. Joseph, again, is weary. <laughs> Part of the reason for that is, it is a little bit comical, but part of the reason is, uh, whom do you want to emphasize? And if you don't want him to be a principal actor, then you might let him rest. And he has led them on a journey for the census to Bethlehem. Virgin is very beautiful. A uh, little child is almost on the ground, but not. He's cradled here, surrounded by little angels, more angels here. Um, a tree bearing fruit, which is uh, a symbol of salvation. Um, our friend. <laughs> this is a great example of Mantegna's skill at foreshortening, the skill of showing somebody in a flat surface who looks nevertheless to be, uh, to have body parts in different dimensions. Uh, the road to the town and the shepherds looking as plain as could be, scruffy, um, followed by these other two. I've asked before here, does anything seem off in the painting to you? Does it seem odd that they're sort of cropped here? Um, and I ask it for kind of curiosity's sake, well, what's going on there? But also to encourage you to trust your vision. If you look long enough at this wonderful painting, it's not very large. It is, in fact, about so big, which is something you always have to think about when you're seeing illustrations in books or newspapers or in slides. And what is the scale? Uh, it is so well done that you might think it monumental, but in fact, it's a relatively small piece in the Italian galleries, about five, four or five galleries in. Well, in fact, it has been trimmed over here, uh, whether accidentally or on purpose, but it's a little off balance and the figures of the shepherds uh, are incomplete. So if you look at this, you think, I wonder if there's something wrong there. Trust yourself. There very likely is. So that's Mantegna, about 1450. Um, from from the, the Met. This is a, a slightly later painting, about 1475, 1476, and indeed a very great painting. This is by Hugo van der Goes, uh, who we don't know when he was born, but he died in 1482. This is in the Uffizi, it's very large, it's a triptych, and it's called the, the uh, Portinari Altarpiece. It was commissioned uh, for the church of the Hospital of Santa Maria in Nueva, and it was commissioned by Tommaso Portinari, hence the name of the piece. Uh, Portinari uh, worked in Rouge, in the Netherlands, 
uh, 40 years representing the, the de Medici family as a banker. And here he is at prayer as the donor with his sons uh, who were, uh, let me see, I have the names, uh, Antonio and Vigello. And they are with their patrons, St. Thomas and St. Anthony. On the right panel is his uh, wife. The donor is typically, as you may remember, portrayed in smaller form, uh, typically kneeling. And his wife, Maria de Francesco Baroncelli, you know, it's like Gino de Brigida, the gorgeous name, <laughs> with her daughter, Margarita. And they are with their patrons, Mary Magdalene, who bears the ointment with which to, that's her sign, with which to anoint Jesus, and St. Margaret with a book and little dragon. The central panel is what commands attention. It is incredibly masterful. Uh, this is 1475. Uh, beautiful Flemish angels. You notice the different light. This is, although done uh, for uh, Florence, it's done with northern light. Um, Joseph, gorgeous, gorgeous, reverent virgin, and the child, uh, most unusually, on the ground, bare on the ground, protected only by radiance. Uh, two angels here, three here, two more, uh, these two. There was apparently in Bethlehem a very good uh, department store with clothing for various angels. <laughs> and here are the shepherds um, who are so wonderfully plain compared to all this richness. Um, so why does Luke have the shepherds? Um, what would you think? Well, they were simple people uh, to whom the uh, birth of the Lord was first announced. They were relatively poor and humble people to whom the birth of the Lord was first announced. Um, shepherds at the time were actually often uh, very suspect folk. They were often considered uh, uh, duplicitous and even robbers. Uh, the real reason more likely is that Luke wants to connect the birth of Jesus with the city of Bethlehem from which these shepherds come, he tells us, because he wants you to understand Jesus being born in Bethlehem as was David, who was, born, was of the city of Bethlehem and was a shepherd. So it's the Old Testament connection which is at work here more than the um, somewhat sentimental and uh, improvised interpretation. In the left panel, that's Jesus and Mary um, coming to, um, to uh, Bethlehem. And in the background here, the shepherds are being told the good news. And I can't make it out from my, but here I can find it. Here in the background are the Magi coming to, um, to Bethlehem to worship the child. Uh, once again, you have conflated the two Gospels. It's the primary intention of, of the painting is to be an adoration of the shepherds. Oops. An adoration of the shepherds but by including the Magi in the background, which was a typical early and into the High Renaissance uh, practice, uh, the artist has really conflated the two, uh, which is again fine, but it will, it will distract you, for example, from the real symbolism of what the, what the shepherds are about. Uh, here is the donor 
Tommaso Portinari in a better view than you could see in the side panel, and indeed in a very great painting to my mind. Some of you have seen this before, at least when I showed it. This is by Hans Memling. It's in the very first gallery of the uh, Flemish paintings in the Met, and it's in three-quarter profile. He's praying here. Uh, he's about 40 when it's done, and to my mind, it's one of the greatest images of somebody at prayer there is, and you can see how he would uh, commission the painting we just saw. Here was another painting by Hugo van der Goes <clears throat> of the uh, Adoration of the Shepherds, and in the eyes of a number of people, uh, an even greater painting. It's um, incredibly alive. Here we have two almost life-size prophets pulling back the curtains so that you can see this revelation. And the shepherds, are rushing to the sea. They're hurtling into the room. It's just an incredible combination of human drama and visionary quality. And the Virgin is, I think, even more beautiful. I think it perhaps increases her effect that she is closer to the child, and that Joseph is praying on the other side, but clearly she is given a prominence that, um, that uh, is, is given a prominence. Well, this is Luke. And in Luke's gospel, in the infancy narrative, Mary is the major protagonist. Whereas, in Matthew's gospel, um, Joseph is given the major role. So it's another reason for letting Joseph take a nap. <laughs> so that's Hugo van der Goes, The Adoration of the Shepherds. It's in the Berlin Museum. Here is one of the greatest paintings in America, Giorgione's Adoration of the Shepherds. Some of you have seen this at the National Gallery. It's one of the great, great treasures of the gallery. Um, it was done about 1505 or 1510. And one should really just contemplate it. Giorgione was born in the town of Castel Franco uh, northwest of Venice, he was he's ranked with the Venetian school. He was born about 1476 or 1478. He only lived until 1510 in a very short career. There's very little that is securely documented as from his hand. And most of the paintings that we do know from him are quite small. Nevertheless, he had an enormous influence uh, at the beginning of the High Renaissance, enormous influence. He began, he probably studied with Bellini in Venice, Giovanni Bellini, the great painter of all those beautiful Madonnas, with many other paintings as well. Probably studied with Bellini. Um, but he had a, a genius that played on for the rest of the 16th century. He was the first painter to clearly subordinate subject matter to the evocation of mood. So we've been looking at paintings that tell the story of the shepherds. And indeed, their story is told here. Uh, this painting, by the way, is about so big. Uh, but in every way, he evokes a contemplative, quiet mood, a little stream of water the opening of the landscape towards the town and the sky, the cave background. It reminds me always of the painting of uh, St. Francis at the Frick uh, by Bellini, which would be a little later, uh, uh, pardon me, earlier. Um, the darkness 
as with the St. Francis, contrasts with all this light and gives the, this corner of the painting a solidity which helps it not to fall out of balance. Because all the action you see is in the lower quarter of the painting. And yet, it doesn't seem in any way out of balance. On the contrary, it just draws you in. And if you go off the path on into the town, you know how to come back as soon as you can to reverence the child. Uh, He's credited with being uh, the inventor of the landscape of mood. And uh, it may not be apparent from this one example, but he dominated the artistic imagination of Italian painting for decades afterwards. Um, a near contemporary, um, uh, but uh, slightly older, and he lived longer, Correggio, Antonio Allegri, named after the town he was born in, uh, Emilia, um, painted this Adoration of the Shepherds, which is again from Berlin. Uh, the uh, Giordoni influence is evident in the nocturnal mood. He takes advantage of the fact that the event was proclaimed at night, which also enables him to play with light which seems less to fall upon the virgin and child than to come from them. Uh, the shepherds, uh, exultant in having found what the angels told them. Uh, Joseph keeping guard. Um, the uh, foreground is very plain, but carefully done to give it depth, and the, the dawn is marvelous, marvelous. Um, this is Correggio, who may well have studied either with or the works of Mantegna. He was also very influenced by Leonardo, and you can see that in the uh, sfumato, which is something that Leonardo prized highly, and it is, um, what is meant by sfumato is that colors blend into each other, so that here it's very evident. This one tunic, short tunic, becomes very light, and this light, uh, and it's more evident in, in daylight pictures. So instead of going from red to yellow, uh, the cloak and the tunic clearly differentiated, they would blend the way smoke blends colors. Um, it's called sfumato. It's, it's, med it's meditative, but not as meditative as the Rajoni. It's more dramatic and it's elegant. Her face, he's concerned to make her face look very winning and beautiful. Here's a painting which you know, I'm sure, from countless uh, Christmas cards. This is Federico Barocci. Um, it's from the Prado in Madrid. Uh, Barocci was a late Renaissance painter, 1535 to 1612. And it's about, it's quite large, but it's about so big. Um, here, the Virgin's adoration and beautiful garment uh, includes a great deal of acceptance, don't you think? She's in utter awe of the child. And uh, he's way over here at the side, but with this wonderful ascending line. Well, many people have never noticed Joseph is actually opening the door for the shepherds. So it is an adoration of the shepherds, quite really. This is um, 1576, about 20 years later, uh, we have a similarly plunging viewpoint, and this is Caravaggio himself, 
who, as you know, used very ordinary folks as his models and uh, eschewed grand settings for uh, realistic settings that ordinary people might identify with. So here is Mary in another pose of very pensive adoration. You could imagine her saying, after she's been told uh, that she's going to bear a son who will be the Son of God and Savior in the Annunciation scene in Luke, you can imagine her saying, what is to come of this child? Um, the angel plunging down is uh, part of the heavenly host saying in Latin, glory in the heights to God, glory in excelsis Deo. And the shepherds are dressed rather like Franciscans, but, um, but they're shepherds. Very workman's hands uh, here too, but especially here. It's hard to imagine a more human and dramatic portrayal of the nativity and the presence of the shepherds very soon after it. Here is, uh, you all recognize El Greco, I'm sure, and I think I've shown this painting to you on a number of other occasions, but I want to emphasize that this is the adoration of the shepherds and by El Greco, painted very late in his life, 1612, he died in 1614, and to my mind, it's a perfect example of what I call the, uh, the contemplative visions of late El Greco. He's often thought to have become simply more and more mannerist and stylized, elongating his figures, uh, uh, sinuous lines, dramatic skies, uh, dramatic colors. I think he's recording something like you might have in an Ignatian prayer of contemplation of place. It has left the realm of uh, even spiritual uh, observation and is in the realm of prayerful vision. And indeed, this is he, El Greco, centered um, among the other shepherds who are of different ages, of different poses, adoring the child, and he painted it for his tomb. He painted that about 1612 or up till his death in 1614. About 40 years later, um, 30 years later, is this marvelous painting from the Louvre of the Adoration of the Shepherds by George de la Tour. You remember that de la Tour was a great, uh, he, he used light very dramatically, uh, somewhat similar to Caravaggio, but um, with a the light is almost always from one central point. And here it is from the child himself, up into the mother's face, handsome young reverend shepherd, slightly bemused shepherd. She's not a shepherdess. She was either there to help Mary or they brought her along a jug of food, the child wrapped in swaddling clothes on the plainest of basket-like cribs. I, I, it's just, it's rhapsodic, isn't it? It's just, why would you go on? But anyway, I have Magi to show you. Um, here is another very different mood. Uh, de La Tour is French, but he's a very distinctive 17th century painter. Here is a somewhat more typically French painter, Louis Lenin, uh, who lived from 1600 to 1648, uh, similar years to De La Tour. They overlapped a great deal. This is called The Adoration of the Shepherds, and it's from the National Gallery in London. But what I want to remark in it is how, again, plain and human 
shepherd, the shepherd boy, uh, he retains two little angels. Uh, the child in this case returns the mother's gaze. Uh, Joseph, it really is like a family scene. Uh, the, these are not models from a runway. These are these are real ordinary people, and it's what Lenin was famous for, painting ordinary life. Here is a painter who was, is often uh, mistaken for or thought to be uh, Rembrandt, but uh, on closer look, you'll see that it really is quite different from Rembrandt. He's Gerrit von Honthorst. He was born in 1592, about uh, 14 years before Rembrandt, and he died in 1656, uh, about 15, 1658, about a decade before Rembrandt. But he is a uh, Dutch painter. And this is called the Adoration of the Shepherds from the Uffizi. The emphasis on light perjures, but of course it would. The scene suggests it. We have a greater crowd of, of shepherds here. One, two, three, four, five. This is Joseph. And here, for the first time we've seen this, the mother is literally showing the child radiant to the visitors. Uh, a very motherly gesture. Uh, and these are the angels from the previous scene. The, there is a scene of the angel of the Lord announcing to the shepherds the birth of the child. Then the heavenly host appears, and then they make haste to Jerusalem. It's not said that the angels accompanied them. This is the real Rembrandt. branch. And this is indeed a great adoration of the shepherds from the Alta Pinacothek in Munich. Um, the light comes off of the child. As typical in Rembrandt, most of what is happening happens in the lower half of the painting. All this empty space serves to suggest uh, the greater world in which the birth of Christ takes place. Um, he loved to dress people up in oriental garb. Um, and never having been to Palestine, he thought he could get away with this. There is a very similar painting of the Adoration of the Shepherds based on this painting uh, in London. So if you don't get to Munich to see it, you can see it in London. And the last painting of shepherds that I'll show you is by Poussin, which is a little bit later than the Rembrandt. The Rembrandt is 1646. This is perhaps 10 years later. And it's Nicolas Poussin, The Adoration of the Shepherds. This is French classicism at its peak. Uh, nobody stands for the elegance and balance and classical sense of French culture in the 17th century nearly so well as Poussin. It's again a uh, crumbling ancient edifice. Paganism is gone. Christianity has arrived. Um, to my mind, this virgin is one of his very most successful figures. Lovely Joseph paying great attention. Um, and the shepherds, it's a cascade of reverence. They brought a girlfriend along who has somehow procured instantly a great fruit basket from uh, who, who are those two fellows who send you fruit baskets? Right. Yes. Uh, well, they got in touch somehow. The shepherds sit with those folks. The shepherds appear only in uh, Luke. Matthew has a, an interest in showing that the uh, Gentile world was also brought to the Christ child. Matthew was writing principally for a Jewish community, but it had Gentile members. They both wrote, by the way, their Gospels in sometime in the 80s, it is thought, we don't know exactly when, but their audiences were different. Luke wrote in Syria, 
he wrote, he spoke apparently and wrote very, very good Greek, and he probably was speaking to Greek-speaking Jewish converts. But Matthew was speaking to a mixed community, and the bringing in the Magi was a way of saying, here are people also uh, for whom Christ was also born. They learn about the birth of the King of the Jews from a star, that is to say, from natural inquiry. They go to Jerusalem to find out uh, what is happening, and they hear about the prophecy of Jesus' birth. So it's a combination of natural reason and scriptural information. Uh, but here we're with Luke, and this is the shepherds. Again, uh, it's a truck outside that has brought other visitors. Um, the composition is pretty fantastic. Uh, so imagine deciding, I'm going to put everything. I'm going to put the center of the action in this small lower corner. But it circles and is framed by the classical architecture. Let me show you now uh, pictures of the, of the Magi. And the very first is one of my favorites. This is Duccio, uh, done for the Maestà in Siena, which, as you know, when he finished it around 1311, was carried from his studio to the cathedral, and the whole city came out to rejoice in what the master had done and its fame uh, filled the hearts of every Sienese. Uh, when Vasari wrote The Lives of the Painters, however, um, he had not taken the trouble to go down to Siena, which is a short trip, uh, to find out about Duccio. So he barely mentions him. He was Florentine. And indeed, he ascribed many of Duccio's paintings to, who else, Giotto, who was also Florentine. Does this remind anybody of the virgin that the Met owns, that little small virgin? Yes. Not so much the child who's gesturing to the kings beautifully, but the virgin with the typical star on her veil, um, with this dancing golden line at the ed ed edge of a robe. Uh, this is a very small predella piece, small piece below the main scene of the, uh, the Maestar, the front of which centered on Mary's life, the back, the passion of Jesus. The eldest king typically is kneeling to kiss the child. Um, the next eldest king is looking towards the youngest, who's looking back here. It's a very natural interplay of gestures. There are two uh, accompanying uh, guards who have been propped from the image. It's, it's a cave, really, with a, a, a bit of uh, lumber to hold it up. Uh, 1308. I mean, they're beautifully painted. Beautifully painted and in great condition. Look at the embroidery on his shoulder. Uh, by this time, they have names. In uh, Matthew's Gospel, they are magi, or wise men, from the West. The first thing that happened to them is that they became kings. And then they became three of them. And then, because of the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, most likely. And then, by the fourth century in the East, they, required, they acquired names, a variety of names. By the sixth century in the West, the names settled, and they became... Melchior, the eldest, Gaspar, or Caspar, and Balthazar, kings with crowns. There is his crown, which he seems to have put over his right forearm. Um, here is a Giotto, again from the Scrivani uh, Chapel, and uh, Typically for Giotto, the, the bodies are fully formed. Uh, they're very natural. Again, natural blue sky background. 
as with the the birth scene with the shepherds, just a little place to cover the family. The child is presented on his mother's lap, um, quite attentive, and the, Joseph and Mary are accompanied by the angel. I guess that's a horse. Do you think it's a camel? Mama. Do the camels have ears like that? I believe you. Here is a, a marvelous, marvelous painting. We can't spend nearly the time it deserves on it. This is Stefan Lochner, uh, L-O-C-H-N-E-R, who was active, uh, especially in the mid-15th century, very active between 1442 and 1451, in which years he did this adoration of the Magi for the cathedral in Cologne. Uh, it was to Cologne in, in 1192 that the most revered relics of the Magi came as a gift from Frederick Barbarossa, who had pillaged uh, the South. And he sent the, the relics to Cologne, which are still held in a beautifully enameled uh, case behind the high altar. Uh, this painting is worth going to Europe to see. It's on the on the right or uh, south ambulatory uh, of the cathedral behind the altar there. Um, Melchior, Gaspar, and where is, where is, I can't see from here. I guess this is Balthazar. But that's Melchior and that's Gaspar. Uh, they bring gifts of gold for Christ's kingship, uh, frankincense for his divinity, and myrrh it was interpreted because he will suffer for us. Uh, oh, there's the uh, gold, actually, and there's the myrrh. Uh, on the sides are St. Ursula and her fellow martyrs, patrons of um, uh, Cologne and King George. It's quite large. It's a triptych and it's about, well, let's see, it's about so big. Stefan Lochner, he painted in a typical Rhineland fashion, a Rhenish fashion, uh, gentle and sweet. He has a very famous Madonna of the Roses, uh, which is adorably sweet. Some people might say too sweet. I don't think so. It's just, it's very dear. And this is another great, great triptych. Uh, this is called the St. Columba Altarpiece. It's about the same period, just a few years later. It's about 1455. It's in the Alta Pinacotech in Munich. And you see why I went astray to get these beyond the Met, because this is just... Roger van der Weyden was the, the great successor to Jan van Eyck and uh, uh, rivaled him and then out rivaled him in fame and was thought to be far and away the best painter in Northern Europe. And his fame lasted until the 17th century when, it's a real moral story, uh, he just went out of fashion completely. Nobody paid any attention to him. And until late in the 19th century, when people began to look at early Flemish art and early Italian art as well, and then at the beginning of the 20th century, in the first decade of the 20th century, two great exhibitions were held on Flemish primitives and Italian primitives. We would no longer say that. You wouldn't call Duccio a primitive for Pete's sake. And you wouldn't call this man a primitive. But that's, so we say early Italian, early Flemish. Gorgeous version, virgin. And that is um, Melchior, Gaspar, or Caspar, and that's Balthazar. He's thrown his hat to the ground, hat not crown, you notice. Mm -hmm. Even with Ducho, he had crowns. Joseph, the background. Now that looks about as much like Bethlehem, but uh, 
he was painting for people who would say, oh yeah, I, I could imagine this, I could imagine this. And people have, have joined the kings, either from their retinue, or people came, who came down from Jerusalem with them to look in on the scene. A beautiful, beautiful annunciation. We have one at the Met, a Roger van der Weyden annunciation, with the, with the lily of virginity, and over here, uh, the presentation of the temple. So the adoration of the kings, the annunciation, the pre presentation of the temple. Does anything strike you about conflation here? Well, it's Matthew, and only Matthew, who tells the story of the kings, for the reason I summarized all too briefly. It's Luke who tells the story of the Annunciation. In Luke's Gospel, Mary is the primary agent. In Matthew's Gospel, Joseph is the primary agent, the person on whom the action uh, takes place. Jesus, of course, is the focus. But it's Joseph who gets the dreams that leads him to take the child to Egypt, for example. So beautiful as they are, they're theologically a little bit off. But I hope in heaven this genius forgives me. Um, here is a, a detail of the, uh, of the Van der Weyden piece. So I mentioned it's called the St. Columba Altarpiece from the place it was painted for. And here you can see even better the skill with which he draws the elderly king. He's rapt, but he's very intelligent. This is not fanatic worship. This is not the worship of uh, losing yourself, really. It's losing himself in love, if you will, but he's not gonna do something crazy after this. It's, that's fanatic love. And this king, likewise, he hasn't quite gotten to the actual scene, he's the youngest. Gorgeous tint of head. You notice not a halo, but a radiance. Here is another triptych of the of the uh, Adoration of the Magi. This is called the Pearl of Brabant. It's by Dirk Boots, the younger, or perhaps the elder, and I'm just saying that because People aren't settled. I think it's more commonly thought now that it's the younger. He lived uh, 1410 to 1475, a little bit longer in the Netherlands than uh, Van der Weyden. And this is about 10 years later than the Van der Weyden, about 1465. It's again from the Alta Pinacotec. And the Virgin is not quite so elegant, but very lovely. Uh, again, there are no crowns. Uh, Joseph is accepting the gift. The retinue is marvelous. Starts all the way up here. It's very prayerful. John the Baptist, the precursor. Saint Christopher, by now a very popular saint. Uh, here again, there's a conflation because John the Baptist does not figure in the infancy narrative of Matthew, but very prominently in the first chapter, the first chapter of St. Luke. That previous painting was, is called the Pearl of Brabant. It's quite small, it's about so big. Uh, this is larger, and this is by our friend Memling, who did the portrait of Tommaso Portinari. And this is Memling's Adoration of the Magi, about 1470. Adoration of the Magi, the birth scene. Good, the birth scene. The um, presentation with Simeon and Anna, we talked about that. This gains by a certain simplicity. The center is so uncrowded. Typical Memling face, very oval. The elderly king again kneeling. 
the uh, Caspar uh, with the frankincense, and what do you notice? This is one of the first appearances, but not the first, of one of the kings as black and young. This is also from our uh, National Gallery of Art, and this is Botticelli, which is the most crowded scene I've shown you, the adoration of the Magi uh, with a huge retinue uh, in a very decidedly crumbling antique shelter. You'll notice the same thing in the Mets tree. Remember the little tree? Uh, the, uh, in the Mets tree, the Virgin and Child and Joseph are set against classical ruins. The composition is extraordinary. The way, the way the crowd swirls around the center scene that you keep coming back to, and then this very strong centering block, which is which is actually very abstract. Do you notice you, you, you begin to lose the detail of it and just feel this heavy centering? Now that's a change of pace. The membling is about 1470. This uh, the Botticelli is about 1470. This is Velasquez's 1619 painting in the Prado. He was 20 years old. This is one of my favorite representations of the scene because it is so simple. And what do you notice here? The second Magus is the first to reverence the child and offer his gift with this more expectant than worshipful look, don't you think? He's, what do we have here, my goodness? The older king is regal and attentive. And he could be Moorish, could he not? One of their servants. The painting has been criticized because some people think, including Jonathan Brown, who's the authority on Velasquez in America. The child is sitting rather flatly on the virgin's lap. Uh, the you wonder where the child's legs are, he says, and he finds the transition from the foreground to the background um, undeveloped and unsatisfactory. The, 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 the dawn is sort of added, he thinks. I am so impressed by the simplicity he, he discusses it purely aesthetically. I love the fact of the simplicity and the sobriety of the scene and the more ordinary looks of the admittedly not very Eastern figures. He thinks it's crowded. It is a little crowded. But by bringing them all so closely together in a not very large painting, uh, the central drama is conveyed, but in very sober, realistic terms, as would become typical for Velasquez as his great skill developed. And I have not pointed out before when I could have, but here, that's a thorn bush. So there is a very discreet reference to the crown of thorns and to Christ's suffering. We saw the Rembrandt Adoration of the Shepherds. This is the Rembrandt Adoration of the Magi, 10 years after Rodrigo, uh, Velasquez's Adoration, so 1632 from the Hermitage. Um, this is mid-career Rembrandt, where the figures are quite clearly delineated. One king, another king, another king. This fellow is again dressed up very much like the guy in the Adoration of the Shepherds. Um, the scene is uh, suggested as very densely figured, but he doesn't go into enormous detail. Over here are the camels. And here's our friend Poussin again, Nicolas Poussin, um, a little bit um, 
or just about the same time as the Rembrandt. This is 1633, the adoration of the shepherd, of the Magi from Dresden. Uh, this time he has the Virgin and much larger in the left side of the painting, again in crumbling ruins. Um, a servant girl wandering, uh, the older king, the crown, the gold, the uh, younger, the Gaspar, Balthazar. A typical uh, uh, part of the retinue of the kings, a muscular Roman, a muscular soldier that would have come with them, somebody from the town, and, and this is their arrival up here. So that's Poussin. Uh, Peggy, you know better than I, but to me this is French. This is 17th century, classic French. Uh, brilliant range of colors. Uh, he's much less interested in Leonardo Spumato. Colors are very clearly defined. Um, and though the pagan has been uh, outmoded or superseded, it's still given its due. Two more just two great uh, Spanish 17th century artists portraying the adoration. And the first is Zurbaran, the adoration of the Magi, about 1640, from the Museum of Fine Arts in Grenoble. Beautiful Spanish face. She and the child are cousins of Velasquez, don't you think? <laughs> Everything about them except this is further into Zerberon's uh, career and uh, further into his skill. Um, the elder king, somebody carrying his uh, cloak, the black king with the gift. And the next and last of the kings is Murillo's, uh, Bartolome Esteban Murillo, who uh, lived a little bit longer than both Velasquez and uh, Zerberan. And this is the Adoration of the Magi from about 15, 1655. It's in Toledo. Um, but she's less pronouncedly and vividly Spanish, but Spanish and very sweet. King has ermine here. Two servant girl, servant boy, the uh, Gaspar figure, very dark hair, and the Balthazar. What more recent, and this will be the final and more brief part of the presentation, what more recent images might we find of the adoration of the shepherds and the adoration of the kings? And what might bring us back to considering whether the images we've seen represent real worship of the really holy and provide some criticism of the false worship of demagogues? Well, they're very hard to find. They're very hard to find. I've asked uh, real art experts, do you know any good contemporary images of the adoration of the shepherds or the adoration of the kings? And um, this is not contemporary, of course, and, the, and it's, I'm afraid it's very bleached out. I'm not sure from where I am look, looking, but I can read it very well as an adoration of the shepherds, with the shepherds over here on the right, uh, the uh, mother and child and Joseph, and the announcing angels, again conflating the two scenes, but with some uh, appropriateness. This comes from the New Roman Missal, opposite the, uh, the Mass for Christmas morning. Uh, you won't see it because it's the Missal that the priest will have in front of him. Uh, this is the image that will pre be presented to him. I presume that 99 out of 100 priests in New York will not pay any attention to it whatsoever. Uh, what if it were a really good piece of art? 
It might help them to observe the silence which is recommended at that moment. Now this is better to my mind because this is a good woodcut from the 15th century. And this comes again from one of the Roman Missals. There are five different publications of the new Roman Missal. Uh, there is an altar missal which goes on the altar in a church. And there's a chapel missal which we have, for example, in America House for a small chapel, but we have a small altar and we don't have, we have guests coming to Mass, but we don't have a regular public. So it's a chapel missal, it's much smaller. And in what we have, there are um, the Magnificat, people who put out the Mass booklet, they have put out a version of the, of the um, Missile. And there is this 15th century woodcut, which it, it's, it's only about the original woodcut, but it was so big. Um, but it's charming and uh, clearly simplified the star. Um, but um, interesting that. This is clearly a crown, or at least I think it's a crown. That doesn't seem to be a crown at all. And I don't know what he was wearing, or what he's exactly thinking. Here is an image of Isaiah for the Advent season from the Roman Missal that the liturgical press has put out. And this is a piece of art by Martin Erspommer, a Benedictine monk of St. Meinrad Abbey. He's developed, and you may have seen his work before, a kind of geometric, iconic, like Byzantine icons, figuration, which is quite effective. Um, it doesn't pretend to, to great realism, but it's, it's very, it's realistic art. But it has, to my mind, a, a, simple, a simple power to it. And this image I like quite well. This is again by S. Palmer, and this is again from a Roman Missal, um, and it's the uh, Three Kings, of course. It has some of the uh, naive, simple charm of the woodcut we saw a moment ago. Uh, it conveys the scene um, with um, directness and simplicity, um, it doesn't so much hold your attention for its sheer beauty, but it, it's thoughtful. It helps you, I think, to think. Something similar, uh, uh, but um, a little bit more complicated, is this, uh, I'm afraid it's in black and white, it's an enamel, and it is about so big. It belongs to the Metropolitan, and it's by an artist named Egino, E-G-I-N-O, Vinert, V-E-I-N-E-R-T, and it's a cloisonne enamel, the star and the three kings with these wonderful different expressions. He's so happy, he's sad, he's astonished, he doesn't know what to say. <laughs> uh, imagine that in brilliant red and yellow for the gold and the crown. And when the lights go on, I'll show you we have it at America a reproduction of one of his adorations. I like him very much. In America, in June of 2003, I wrote an article on the editor's request. I would say that his representations of the uh, adoration of the kings are as uh, available and also effective as I have found in contemporary art. He is very old now and may not even be alive anymore. I tried to find out last time I was in Cologne two years ago. He was, was very sick with pneumonia. So I looked and looked, and Barbara, this is where we get to you and your pals. I looked for uh, other artists. Uh, Paul Gauguin has a painting of Christmas night, but it's the oxen going to the shed where the child is. And Horace Pippin, the black artist, has a lovely, naive painting, folk art painting of Christmas Day. And Jacob Lawrence, the great black painter, has a painting of Christmas Day. But I haven't been able to find an adoration except one. And it's by Romare Bearden, a very, very 
great, this is not the image, a great uh, black artist. Uh, he did this, Madonna and Child, in 1945, and it's in Bryn Mawr, the college there. Uh, it's about so big. That's his signature bar, Bearden, Romar, R-O-M-A-R-E, Bearden, B-E-A-R-D-E-N. And it's highly influenced by uh, analytic cubism, of course, but with a very much more vibrant palette, the mother and the child. And it's called Madonna and Child. In many ways, I would be led more to pray about Mary and Jesus by looking at this, because it doesn't tell me as much, though it shows me a lot. It's very evocative. Um, the firm way she holds the child in her arms. It's all the, all the Madonnas we've seen hold the children securely or are ready to hold them securely. But there's an emphasis here that you could pray about for a couple of days. You, and you'd forget the, uh, the fineness of the representation. Here's something I like even better, obviously no longer so in, uh, dependent upon Cubism, and indeed it's much later, it's uh, 1970, the other one was 1945. This is called um, Black Mother and Child. And clearly, the, the mother at least, and perhaps, although the child's coloring would indicate that they're African Americans, but it could just as easily be called Madonna and Child. Could it not? It's the mother and the child from whom the grace of all life thereafter comes. And the last image, this is his three wise men. <coughs> One with his gift. <coughs> Two with his gift, but where is it? He has it, I'm just blanking, folks. And the third wise man here. It's like seeing music made to play after you read the story of the wise man, which could lead you not to retell the story but to let the way the story touches you surface, which is something that abstract art can do, that highly representational art can't do, or doesn't so easily do, because its visual detail commands you so. So I love this painter. I love this painter, even though I'm sorry I haven't been able to find the, the other two gifts. But they are there as clearly as this one is. That is to say, you can find them. <laughs> uh, but he's not, he's not really terribly worried about that. So when we look at images of, uh, in closing, when we look at images of the adoration of the shepherds and adoration of the Magi, one question to ask is how evangelical, how faithful to the gospel are they? Which is not being literal. But how much do they convey the spirit? And how much do they wander off into pious elaboration or uh, acceptable but better avoided conflation? Another question is, does the image, does the painting convey a sense of the holy, the holy other, of an event which is truly transcendent. And if it gets too detailed, 
and if it gets too historicized and above all too pretty, it's not likely to convey that sense of a really holy. And the third question is, is it not only, does it convey not only religious feeling, but does it have some critical import to it as you stay with it? Is it about good news? Or is it just a portrayal of a lovely event in the countryside and under a crumbling Roman ruin? Is there a portrayal in it of good news which is new and which means a different view of the world? A view completely unlike the view that those people worshiping Hitler and Mussolini and Mao suggest. And what is that view? That view is that there is one God and one God alone and only God is to be worshiped and only God, only God is absolute. And we believe that not only because the Old Testament which clearly teaches it, but because in Jesus we find God's living word utterly credible and suffering, dying, and being raised for us, which we can believe because we are given the Spirit of God every morning in our hearts. Christianity is not too much more complicated than that. And many of the details we see in religious art are delightful, and it's wonderful our museums have them. But if you're to build a new church, is that what you would put in the church? I personally believe that if a community today is building a new church, they ought to go look for their artists and say, well, our community likes storytelling. If you're gonna build in the Southwest for Latinos, they will want stories. Good, they should have them. If you're gonna build in Mexico, they're gonna want stories. Good, have them. But don't put up reproductions of Raphael, uh, or, or even Duccio, <laughs> whom I obviously adore. If you're going to build a church um, in Maine, Portland, or Portland, Oregon, what kind of imagery would you uh, keep for Christmas or show at Christmas? And what do you use on your announcements and your bulletins? Well, the people of the time of all these artists we saw went to their artists. And we should go to our artists, I think. And I hope there'll be more artists like Romer Bearden who will show us that you can really jive with the Three Kings. Thanks very much.
What a wonderful way to begin our celebration of the Christmas season, beginning this afternoon with the blessing of the crush and the lighting and the blessing of the tree, having a casual informal dinner in the castle parlors and singing carols, and then tonight culminating with the first in our lecture series. I'm so grateful to Father Leo Donovan for being here tonight. Thank you so much. Leo is so generous and supportive of the College of Nurse Shell, not only as a trustee, but for sharing your talent and skill and expertise and explaining art to us as you have in several lecture series. We're just so fortunate to have you, and I'm so grateful for your support and your friendship um, and being here tonight. Thank you again, Father Leo. This was wonderful. I'd also like to thank Joan Bailey and Dr. Colette Geary for again another wonderful event and celebrating the inauguration and for all of you being here tonight. I think we have refreshments down the hall. Great, so please join us if you'd like to. And again, thank you all so much. Thank you. Very much. Differences between Mark Matthew and Luke. They're from Ray Brown's book. And I would recommend that before you read them, if you do, read each of the infancy narratives. Read Luke, two chapters. Read Matthew, two shorter chapters. And then these will help you to reflect on the difference, the different things we learn, both precious from each gospel. And as Ray says, uh, these are not additions, these are integral parts to the Gospels, and in this view, and I agree with them, I'm sure he cares greatly, uh, <laughs> they, they, the infancy narratives are Gospels in miniature, and there are more signs than they had time to point out, indications, for example, of the suffering of the child, uh, and the faith that awaited him in the things we saw. I think we put it up one in the last game. So, those of you. <laughs>